Hello, hello, and welcome to another great something interesting. I am your old pal, John the Storyteller, here to tell you something that you probably didn't know. Today's uh, story is going to be a biographical sketch on someone who basically has been lost to history and very nearly was lost forever if it weren't for... Uh, kind of some uh, odd things that happen. But this gentleman uh, was born in 1896 to Italian immigrant uh, parents. Um, he led a relatively unremarkable childhood. He was the fourth of, fifth, uh, the fourth of five children. Um, he uh, was a lifelong virgin never married, uh, never was with a woman uh, by his own admission. Uh, he had very little money. Uh, he was not very well known or appreciated in his time. Uh, during the day he worked as an ordinary draftsman for an architectural firm in San Francisco. He lived his entire life, uh, or at least her entire life, he lived his entire life with his mother. Uh, and then continued to live on in the home that they shared uh, on Alabama Street in San Francisco. <laughs> a very ordinary home uh, that kind of looked like a third grade drafting project. A door in the middle and a window on either side. So, why on earth, you might ask, am I talking about this socially awkward, you know, not rich, uh, not... Uh, well-known, not, uh, uh, you know, employed excitingly, you know, ordinary draftsman fella that uh, has been lost to history. Oh, don't you know me better than that? <laughs> this is, after all, something interesting. And so this gentleman that I'm talking about is not just interesting, he's very interesting. Very interesting for a good reason. The gentleman that I'm talking about is named Achilles G. Rizzoli, and you've probably never heard of him. If you have, good for you, and uh, you know where I'm going with all this. Or at least, maybe you do. I, I don't know that anybody fully understands uh, everything about Achilles Rizzoli. He wrote an awful lot, so he gave us a tremendous peek into his mindset. Um, at first, uh, he, his mindset was one of frustration. Uh, he was involved in a couple lawsuits. One because a, a, a doctor didn't marry his mom like they had promised. So it was like a breach of contract thing or something going on. You know, these were frustrating things. And his writings implied that he was a frustrated person. Um, he made, you know, roughly $2,000 a year. Um, and then one year, his income fell off precipitously, $51. And the reason for that is that he had written a couple books, but his books were verbose and dull and nobody would touch them. So he really could not find an audience for these books and it's not what he's known for. You still can find a copy of The Colonnade, which was his main book. I've not read it. Uh, I wish I had so I could give you a little insight into it. You know, like whenever I did the thing on Ed uh, Leeds going in from Coral Castle, uh, I had read his books, you know, so I gave you a little insight on the, the man's mind. Uh, uh, AG, I haven't read his books, but I've read a book about him, so that, that, that helps a lot. And I've managed to glean information that I'm going to give from other sources that I'm going to give to you today. So, a, I, I said A.G. Rizzoli. Ah, oh, you caught that. Uh, I, I, later in his life, he started going by A.G. And it may have been that Achilles was a little ethnic, you know, for the times, you know, how America was. Or uh, that he felt like it gave him more respect or something like that. He was somebody who really wanted respect. He was somebody who was really going for respect. We all want respect. But A.G. was particularly uh, fond of it, and I'll explain what happened <laughs> if you were to give A.G. the respect. By the way, the respect that was well-deserved. So, why am I talking about this very ordinary guy, and why am I planning on doing a two-parter on this fellow? Well, the answer is because A.G. Rizzoli was a person, was a person of 
what has been described of magnificent visions. And I'm going to quote A.G. Rizzoli right now uh, to get this correct. This is how he described his life, a, a, a brief description of his life. <laughs> he, he, his, his life is lived, in his words, in an unbelievably hermetically sealed, spherical, inalienable maze of light and sound, seeing imagery expanding in every direction. Now, A.G., unlike, say, myself, I can, I can barely draw a stick, a stick figure, but A.G. was able to express these visions, express what he saw through his drawings, because after all, it's not his job that made him interesting, it's not money, it's not lack of a social life. It's not the fact that he lived with his mother his whole life and never married and was never with a woman. Doesn't make any difference. What A.G. did was express himself through the medium that he knew the best, and that was architecture. He was a trained architect. Even though he was an ordinary draftsman during the day, it's doubtful that anyone at his architectural firm had any idea what A.G. was actually capable of. And I'm going to show you a few of A.G.'s drawings through this. I'm not going to stand here and hold the book in front of you the whole time, but you need to understand why I'm so excited about this particular artist. I'm going to show you... Uh, well, okay... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off just for a second, just to torture you a little bit more. A, one of the things that A.G. did was he would symbolically sketch people. People that he liked, people that he appreciated, and people that he loved. And if you gave A.G. a compliment, like I was talking about before, he may very well draw you. But he's not going to draw a picture of you. He's going to draw you as a building. He believed in symbolically sketching people. And of course these buildings were, were of magnificent uh, uh, proportion and magnificent detail. And so, let, let me show you what he thought about his mom. So we'll, we'll, start, we'll, start out, we'll, we'll start out pretty good. So this building actually has been represented from multiple angles. Um, uh, I'm going to show you the side view of it because in, in my view it's the most detailed and the most um, kind of spectacular. You kind of have a moment whenever you see it. Now, uh, I may be able to go, I'm going to hold the book up to the light because this is a ultra low level uh, uh, show that I film in the Shed of Knowledge, which is uh, this little shed that I built behind my house to house my books and uh, so that I can have, you know, a little time to uh, research and, and, and read. So, uh, and also smoke cigars, but... <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, the, the building that represents his mother is called the Cathedral, with a K, and this is an example of A.G.'s work. And hopefully one, uh, I'll be able to go back and put in a much better picture over uh, this so that you can see it a little bit better, but we'll see. So here is an example of A.G. Rizzoli's work. Can you see the amount of detail in this? Well, I'm, I'm kind of trying to, to hold it to you. Again, a lot of this you can, you can look on your own, but, but do you see, uh, I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of detail in these drawings, and this is not just a drawing that he did. There are in existence over 400 such drawings of this detail and this level of different people and other things that he did. Now, he didn't just sketch people. Uh, that, that was a big part of it. But he had, he was a religious person, very religious person, and he had a whole plan for heavenly architecture. And if you want to quote from me about A.G. Rizzoli, it would be that if heaven exists, A.G. Rizzoli is the architect. Because A.G. Rizzoli had a whole world laid out in great detail. And a lot of it is floor plans and things like that, but a lot of it is, is the elevations of these buildings, um, uh, poetry, 
uh, beautifully sketched out uh, and all and, and everything to see. Uh, he called it the YTTE, the Yield to Total Elation. And some of the things that he did, some of the buildings that he was doing, like for example the Shaft of Ascension, is basically a giant suicide machine. Uh, when it was time, it was a, a huge building that you went from chamber to chamber, you know you disrobe in one building and clean yourself in another and pray and read in another and then you'd go to the Shaft of Ascension where you would die and, and theoretically be ascended into heaven. Um, he was greatly influenced. He lived in San Francisco. He moved around a lot in San Francisco, uh, but was always in San Francisco. And in 1906, there was a massive earthquake that, that caused major fires that destroyed buildings in San Francisco. And so all of a sudden, the old architecture of San Francisco was gone. I mean, gone. <laughs> like, San Francisco was gone. And so architecture became a way of changing not only the face of a city but the culture of a city. Arch the, the, ar the new architecture coming out became of, of massive importance. At the same time you had expositions, you had the Beaux Art. Uh, a lot of this stuff that he did is kind of in the Beaux, Beaux Art style, um, which if you're not familiar with is a French style that's, that's uh, elaborate, um, you know, overwhelming. His stuff was particularly over the top, but uh, uh, he kind of concentrated in, in what you would call the, the Beaux Art style. But that became very popular, and uh, uh, so San Francisco, a lot of it was rebuilt in that fashion. Now uh, we lost a lot of great houses. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of like the Mark Hopkins Mansion in, on on Knob Hill, which they nicknamed Snob Hill, which was where all the rich people lived up on up on the hill. Uh, that burned down during the uh, uh, during that time period, but the uh, the architecture that replaced it was equally beautiful and of extreme importance. So he saw this architecture as being very important. So in 1913, he went to the Polytechnic College uh, of um, of engineering and learned about engineering. Uh, now his life was a little unusual. Uh, he had older, older, uh, he had older, an older sister and younger sisters. Like I said, he was the fourth of, uh, of five. And in 1913, his oldest sister became pregnant out of wedlock. And so that was kind of a, a you know, that was bad back then and, and uh, uh, you know, shameful and all this stuff. And so she came to live with him for a while. And then in 1915, his father disappeared with a gun that he had stolen from his employer. Uh, so his father was missing for years and years, I believe nearly 20 years, until they found his body. He had committed suicide. But, but young Achilles Rizzoli didn't know that. And so he didn't know where his father was, why he had gone, or, or what was going, or what on earth was going on. So this affected him deeply. And, uh, the uh, one of the drawings that he he did was called the Dark Horse of the Festival Year. That is his father symbolically sketched. And uh, but anyway, the uh, Achilles Rizzoli continued to sketch people that would you know remark on his work. Now, unlike a lot of artists that that may or may not have realized that uh, their their work was was great. I mean, like for example, Vincent Van Gogh. He knew his his paintings were great, but he didn't know how great they would be. He didn't know that he would be the, you know, the highest priced uh, paintings of all time or all Van Gogh's. Uh, Van Gogh, I think, was quoted as saying, one day someone will recognize that my paintings are worth more than the cost of the canvas and the paint. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> so Van Gogh, <laughs> you were right, very right. Um, but uh, uh, Achilles Rizzoli did realize that, that what he was doing was, was beautiful and, and, and that it should be seen. And so he had what he called the ATE, the Achilles Tectonic Exhibit, um, uh, in the front living room of his house. And even if it seems pathetic that a grown man is showing his art in the living room of his house to the neighborhood children and people, uh, it is not, because 
what I wouldn't give to go to see the ATE in the front living room of Achilles Rizzoli's house because his uh, work was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Um, a young girl came in there whose name is Shirley, and uh, I hope I can find the picture quickly. If not, I'll show it in. I'll show it in part two. Uh, Shirley wrote Achilles a note. Thank you for letting me see your beautiful, uh, you know, your, your beautiful architecture and you know your beautiful uh, drawings and and this that and the other. And so he symbolically uh, sketched Shirley's temple. And yes, he did mean that as a. Uh, as a pun. He's full of puns. Like, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the abbreviation that he uses for um, uh, a bathroom is, oh, where is it? The Acme Sitting Station. Acme Sitting Station is how he would uh, refer to a bathroom. Do you get it? He would refer to it as the ASS. <laughs> so there's so there's a list of all these puns and things. I'll get into this a little bit deeper, and I'll get in a, a little bit more into the YTTE and the functions of those buildings uh, um, um, a little bit deeper. And he would write things on there that was like, you know, uh, Taboha, truly a bit of heavenly architecture. All all these other things, and he would sign all these buildings, you know, A. G. Rizzoli, and it and he would give himself a title. And he used over three dozen different titles like Abitur, Agent, Admirer, Arbiter, Arbitrator, Assignee, Da Da Da, Peacemaker, Pianist, po Poetaster, you know, Illustrator, Idolater, Idler, Harvester, Translator, Trumpeter, Underwriter, Utilizer, Yodeler, <laughs> Zealot, uh, you know, Zitherist, uh, I mean, the, uh, Journeyman. He had all these different, I'm not going to read every one of them to you, but he had all these different. Uh, titles that he would sign to himself depending on the nature of what he what he drew now I couldn't find Shirley's temple right off the bat but here's here's a here's a couple other uh, people symbolically sketched giant you know tower this fantastic building you know the uh, what was an example of, uh, of of people that he would symbolically sketch so AG Rizzoli interesting fellow join me for part two and I'll get a little bit deeper into kind of the inner workings of what he, kind of what he's trying to express and, and what he uh, wanted to, to show the world. So join me for part two and we'll get a little bit more technical. But if you have a chance, you can look on the internet and see an example of some of A.G. Rizzoli's drawings. But if but if you if you get a chance, the book that I read is called A.G. Rizzoli, Architect of Magnificent uh, of Man Magnificent Visions. So anyway, A.G. Rizzoli, go figure. That's something interesting.